from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So welcome, I know most of you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Peggy Bolger and I'm director of the Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. And we have a great program that we've been doing for several years, which is called the Benjamin Botkin Folklife Lecture Series and uh, named after one of the greatest uh, public, I guess the godfather of public folklore, Benjamin Botkin, who also used to work at the Library of Congress. And um, this particular series is actually an acquisitions uh, project for us. We record uh, all of the lectures on video, and they usually get put up on our website within a month, I'd say. And so if anybody misses this, or if you like the lecture and it said somebody else would really love to have seen that, uh, go to our website and get into our webcast, and you'll see all of the Benjamin Bakken lecturers for the past several years. And you can click on that and get the entire um, the entire lecture. And so that is my segue to say that if you have a cell phone or a BlackBerry, if you could turn it off now, because otherwise it'll be recorded for posterity and be on the library's website forever. Um, but today I have uh, the honor of introducing a good friend of ours, uh, Dr. Lee Herring, who's Professor Emeritus from Brooklyn College of the City Uni uh, University of New York, and he'll be speaking on translating African oral literature in global contexts. And uh, Dr. Herring beca began his career, we were talking about this just a minute ago, he began studying 17th century English poetry, but he was uh, soon uh, lured away by the charms of our field, uh, the field of folklore, which uh, was a, a fairly new academic uh, uh, in discipline at the time. And after work in American folk music, his interests focused on African culture and traditions, where he undertook research in Kenya. And then from 75 to 76, he taught at the University of Madagascar as a Fulbright senior lecturer in American folklore and civilization. But while he was there, I think he fell in love with the place. He conducted extensive research on Malagasy culture, which led to the publication of his Malagasy Tale Index, which is a comprehensive analysis of folk tales, as well as Ibonia, Epic of Madagascar, and Verbal Arts of Madagascar, a study of four genres of oral literature. Several years later, a second Fulbright grant enabled Lee to teach on the Indian Ocean island of Mauritius, where he conducted extensive fieldwork again on the cultural interrelations of Southwest Indian Ocean islands. And in his book, uh, Stars and Keys, Folktales and Creolization in the Indian Ocean, explores these complex relations through translating and analyzing stories from Madagascar, Mauritius, Réunion, the Comoros, and the Chekalais. So Dr. Herring's many publications as accolades, as awards, and his involvement in numerous academic societies, including our own American Folklore Society, are too numerous to mention. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any time for his presentation. So uh, after this brief introduction, suffice it to say that he continues to be very active as a scholar and teacher. In addition to Brooklyn College, he has taught folklore at the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Connecticut, and just this past summer at the University of California at Berkeley. So please join me in welcoming Lee Herring. Thank you very much, Peggy, for that lovely introduction. Benjamin Bodkin, whom I remember warmly, was the great American folklorist. His inclusive New Deal vision of culture was the right one, and it transfers right away to global contexts. I'm greatly honored to have been invited to give this lecture in his memory. Were he with us today, Ben might have been skeptical about the global contexts 
that were announced, for instance, by UNESCO in 2003 when it adopted the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. Adopting the convention put the World Cultural Organization into the position of having to supply how to do it manuals for the 129 states parties signatory to the convention. That was where I came in. Uh, the intangible cultural heritage section of UNESCO engaged me to take up and complete a manual on safeguarding oral traditions and expressions. The manual would do its teaching in a way that Ben Botkin would have appreciated uh, by sharply drawn examples and Africa was bound to loom large among those. It would show how successful people are in preserving their own traditions, but he might have had doubts about the kind of help that they would get from government. Two examples from Mali in West Africa. There's a radio station called Radio Parana that broadcasts traditional folk tales in Boma, the language of the Boa people. Boa people live in, in Mali, but also in neighboring in Burkina Faso. Uh, at first, the station recorded folk tales in the villages. Later, storytellers were brought to the studio so that they could be recorded under the best technical conditions. One way of pointing to global context in Boa um, what terms is that audio cassette copies were made available for purchase. Of course, the townsfolk have been able to buy these and play them uh, for, at home for their children. <coughs> but they have also sent the cassettes overseas to their expatriate relatives. The children of Bois people, the children of Bois people living in France can now listen to intangible cultural heritage, which we in America call folklore, to in their native language. So one of the conscious aims of Radio Parana is to revive rural activities for youth and distract them from the charms of town. So this local radio station has created a local African model for reactivating traditional modes of education, which could be followed anywhere in the world. That's one sort of translation. It implies that if you act locally, you are thinking globally. Another radio station in Mali, Radio Seno in Bankas, regularly broadcasts epic songs by local bards in three languages, Togo, Tenge, and Tomo. In this new medium, is there a problem? No, I just wanted to get you some water. Thank you. Thank you so much. In this new medium, epic songs take on considerable weight as history, with the result that Malian intellectuals take them more seriously than they did when the pieces were mere village performances. Malian intellectuals, too, are part of the global context. What I learned from compiling examples like these for a manual on safeguarding oral traditions and expressions was the continually astonishing efforts that peoples around the world make to preserve, perform, and recreate their, their cultural heritages. UNESCO's central stance is pessimistic. UNESCO says, and I quote, many elements of the intangible cultural heritage are endangered due, if, due to effects of globalization, uniformization policies, and lack of means, appreciation, and understanding, which taken together may lead to the erosion of functions and values of such elements and to lack of interest among the younger generations. You can maintain that stance only if you stay aloof from the actualities of performance. In fact, people around the world don't need to be told that living, that their cultural heritage is endangered. They don't need to be told that living heritage is very fragile. People around the world, certainly in Africa, are actively engaged in cultural safeguarding as their response to that sense of fragility. In this time of rapid change, what these people need from their government and their non-governmental organizations is encouragement and help. It is true of their efforts at preserving and safeguarding their intangible cultural heritage or folklore, as it is of all poetry and all translation, preserving folklore is an ethical and political act. 
Mentioning ethics and politics brings me to translation. Henri Michonic, the French poet and Bible translator, has repeatedly declared, there is an ethics of translation, there is a politics of translation. For Michonic, a poem is an ethical act. The performance of a narrative is an ethical and political act. So is translation. I attempted such an act once <clears throat> in translating a piece by Sori Kamara, the Senegalese scholar. I had originally heard it as an oral performance in which he lured his audience into the world of West African myth and became himself a performer and transmitter of oral tradition. It was quite the most moving and unconventional presentation I ever heard at an academic conference. Before that time, Sori Kamara had conducted 10 years of field research in eastern Senegal on incantations, legends, and myths, and put these oral materials into his university teaching, as well as into articles and books. For him, field research, translation of oral literature, teaching, and performing in traditional style were a set of ethical acts, all necessitating each other. They also amounted to a political act to put African verbal art out into the world. When we translate African verbal art, we must translate not a set of words found in a dictionary, but an entire system of discourse. We must connect our reader not with disconnected, quaint little items of folklore, but with the unbroken continuum of African people's communications. Although oral literature studies are so often disregarded by the literary world, the study of oral literature, which in the United States formed part of the study of folklore, is far ahead of literary and cultural studies because folkloristics leads other modes of criticism in observing and recording that continuum of communication. Another thing that I've learned is that in translation or in folklore, difference doesn't disappear. As you know, there is an ideal that translation shall be transparent. A real translation, wrote the German critic Walter Benjamin, a real translation is transparent. Uh, the critic Lawrence Venuti turns that upside down and calls it invisibility. Both in teaching translation skills and in evaluating finished translations, the way a translation can draw praise is to be invisible, and you can see that in the book review section of the Washington Post every week. If, the tr if a translation draws praise, it's because you can't see that it's there. Once an African proverb or folk tale is translated from the source language into the target language, the more indigenous it sounds or reads, the more it is favored. If it doesn't sound as though the speaker of the target language could say it, something must be wrong with the translation. The Yoruba of Nigeria have a proverb, a white fowl doesn't know that it is old. With only those words from the dictionary, without any information about the context and meaning, you have no translation. As a guess, we might think it refers to men and animals so old that their, their hair has turned white. A fowl that was white to begin with would, in theory, not show its age. But in fact, the meaning is quite different. If we take just the context of this proverb, we find that it would be used in the following might be used in the following situation, is a hypothetical situation. The parents of a Yoruba family have to be away from home for a day, and they leave their oldest child in charge of their younger brothers and sisters. During the day, one of the smaller children gets hurt playing in the bush or in some other way. It's not a serious injury, but more than just a little bruise. When the parents come back and find out, they might address the proverb to the oldest child. Now we have a context, but this does not make the meaning of the saying obvious to us. The explanation is this. Among the Yoruba, a white chicken is regarded as special and is associated with divination and other rituals. And the word, the word old also means respected, a connection we do not make in our society where youth is more respected than age. But a white chicken does not know that it is superior to other chickens. The meaning of the saying in this context is that the oldest child acted as if he did not realize that he was responsible for the younger ones, 
acted like a white chicken because he let one of the younger children get hurt. Now, what I am doing with all that explanation is translating Africa in the context of our meeting here today. Not the labor of the translator, but the translatability of the work is what makes it a potential candidate for av availability for world literature. And that's part of the selection process in the literary world. That proverb is perfectly translatable once you grant me the right to tell you about context and meaning. Theorists of translation are coming to see more and more that the, that ideal of transparency or invisibility does no service to African folklore, or African literature, or anything else. Pro proverbs, for example, are not universal. They are different. As to difference in folklore, consider that folklore in African diasporic countries like our own, for example, the uh, Uncle Remus tales of Joel Chandler Harris or the singing of Gullah people in South Carolina, we know that is not African folklore. It is different because people's social, political, and economic situations are different from what their ancestors knew in Africa. Folklore is not preserved in amber, unchanged. Folklore does not fall from the heavens. It does not exist outside history. The idea that folklore or philosophy or art can be separated from the society it's part of is a mistake. And difference exists in all societies. The great American poet Charles Bernstein says that seeing differences, quote, is the source of our social power to intervene, to agitate, to provoke, to rethink, to take sides, using all the formal and cultural rhetorics at our command, end quote. Folklore often exists as a means of boundary maintenance to reinforce people's sense of sameness and connection with one another, and hence reinforce their sense of difference from others. I learned that in Kenya from Kamba children. When a riddle is posed to you, you aren't supposed to guess the answer. You aren't supposed to figure out the answer. You're supposed to either know it already or else find yourself outside the circle of those who know. African riddle and riddling, in fact, is a model of African social reality where difference rules. There are those who know, adults, older children, and those who don't know, that's you. Riddling is also a means whereby children learn skills that are valued by their society and thereby eliminate the difference between themselves and those around them. Otherwise, difference is essential to both folklore studies and translation studies, as it is, in anthrop as it is to anthropology. A distinguished anthropologist has recently written the challenge of cultural analysis is to develop translation and mediation tools for helping make visible differences of interests, access, power, needs, desires, and philosophical perspective. That's uh, Michael M.J. Fisher in his very new book. Difference rules folklore and translation and global contexts. Now comes the fraudulent part of this talk, because instead of talking about Africa, I'm going to talk about countries outside Africa, which are not part of the continent. For about 35 years, I have been translating folk tales, proverbs, riddles, and other verbal art from five island groups, which Peggy mentioned, Madagascar, Mauritius, Réunion, Seychelles, and the Comores, all in the Southwest Indian Ocean. The connection of these islands to Africa is obscure to most of their citizens. My effort has been to demonstrate the central cultural debt these islands owe to Africa through their common history of colonization by Europeans, enslavement of Africans, and exploitation for the world markets. The Southwest Indian Ocean islands owe the largest share of their stories and performance practices to their African forebears. Well, if you want to study verbal art in those islands or on the continent, you will want to get at the actual pattern and content of the material as they are manifested in the original language. The difficulties involved in this task, notably the remoteness of the poetry or the narrative, 
the difficulties are doubled when it comes to translation because historically, translators of verbal art may obscure the content and pattern of the original material. For an American example, the translators of na translations of Native American song texts were suited to the literary tastes of the time, let's say the 1880s or the latter part of the 19th century. But it's difficult for modern readers to appreciate those translations because they do not suit the taste of the present day. Furthermore, the translations distorted the original material considerably. In Native American poetry, the repetition emphasizes the idea of the poetic narrative, yet translators often concealed that repetition. Well, I had to deal with repetition in translating an epic tale from Madagascar, where the art of the word depends upon the skillful disposition of repeated words and phrases. The name of this epic is Ibunya. It comes from, uh, the, it is not from the continent of Africa, but it has a relation to Africa that I'll come back to. It is a narrative poem of the Marin people who are the largest and best known ethnic group in Madagascar. The general outline of Ibunya is a plot so familiar and so widespread that you might think it's inborn to the human race. You meet a hero of royal parentage his mother is barren until she consults a diviner who brings about the hero's conception. The plot goes on to narrate the hero's unusual birth and precocious strength, like the childhood of many folktale heroes. He undertakes a quest for his betrothed, who has been abducted. Uh, he passes tests of his worth. He receives supernatural aid and wins the girl through a struggle with her abductor. Uh, the story ends with his marrying the princess and gaining royal power. Doesn't this sound familiar? Doesn't this sound like many stories that you've met before? Tales following this outline are found all over Europe, all over Africa, all over Asia. And plenty of tales in Madagascar rehearse the same pattern. But there is more. Later in the epic, Ibunya has to combat a crocodile. Here the epic is retelling the worldwide combat myth, the hero's combat with a giant or wild beast. These fairy tale elements link Ibunya with European folk tales and make it more complex. Ibunya deserved translating because it was, or it is, the only tale recorded between the, the east coast of Africa, the coast of Kenya and Tanzania, and the subcontinent of India, that can be called an epic. Epic in English, epopée in French, epos in German. These are all English, French, and German names for a literary genre that for a long time was denied to Africa. That is, the global literary context dominated by the European countries that colonized Africa and Madagascar declared its ownership of the genre. Epic meant Homer and Virgil. Times changed later. Many examples of heroic epic were discovered across Africa. More are still being discovered. And uh, whereas uh, the music of Madagascar and the tomb sculpture of Madagascar uh, have received recognition for being as valuable and as complex as the music and material culture of rich and powerful nations, Nevertheless, uh, those rich and powerful nations are still seeking economic and cultural dominion over the island. That's one of the global contexts. One literary counterpart for Ibunya comes from Central Africa. Generically, for instance, Ibunya is the same sort of hero tale as the Kimbundu tale of Sudika Mambi, published long ago by Eli Chatelain in his collection of tales from Angola. Sudika Mamba, his name means thunderbolt, so you can tell he's a hero. Sudika Mambi speaks from his mother's womb. He's born with his weapons in his hand. He undergoes many adventures in his quest for a wife. He dies and is resuscitated, and he quarrels with his brother. There are other such tales on the continent, and there, and there are plenty of parallels that could be found between the Malgash tale of Ibunya and 
African heroic epics. But there are also contrasts in style. For one contrast, African epics are often sung. Well, there's no evidence for an association of the words of Ibunya with music. The most African thing about Ibunya is its apparent disunity. There are many digressions or apparent digressions that retard the forward movement of the plot. But there's another way of viewing the disunity of Ibunya. When we compare it to African epics like Sunjato or, or Mwindo, the principal common characteristic of these narratives is magnitude, inclusiveness. Sunjata, Mwindo, Ibunya, each is a very long indivisible whole and the seemingly digressive episodes lengthen the tale. Their fluency, however, is not mere verbosity. Here's an example. The hero's mother, this is from early in the piece, the hero's mother has been pregnant for 10 years. He speaks from his mother's womb to announce that her time, well, it's really his time, isn't it? Her time, his, their time has come. And the baby said, take me home, mama. I am not plant leaves to be cooked. I am not sweet potato tops to make sweet potato. I am no hog to pull myself up. I am no hedgehog to go soft. I am no dog to have a dangerous tongue. I am no locust to show off. I am no hedgehog whose prickles can't prevent death. I am no stone to, prevent, to begin rolling. I am no banana of which one is enough. I am no fog to cover the earth. I am no cock to wake in the morning. I am no guinea fowl to carry off my own young. I am no crocodile to wait at the ford. I am an edible arum in the chink of a rock, not crushed with the foot, its leaves not eaten. If you pass over it, your knees swell up. Look at it sidelong, you lose an eye. Point at it, you lose fingers. Place it on the fire, a calamity. Cook it, a disaster. But I am a poisonous creeper from beyond the sea. Pass under it, it blinds you. Step over it, your stomach swells up. Leave it there, it makes your toes drop off. I'm an enormous crocodile, lying in wait at the ford. If a pirogue strikes him, he overturns it. If anyone crosses, he bites his stomach. I am a big house, seen from afar. Not even a whole crowd can chip it, but if they do, it takes revenge. And when those from across the sea catch sight of me, I add them to my servants. I am one dangerous boy. I will destroy my rival's lands at the same time as my own, said the baby in his mother's womb. <laughs> this passage is cast in a formalized dialogue style, which is used by the Marin people for oratory. They call it kabar. Um, and extended passages like this expand what would otherwise be a rather conventional hero story into an epic. There is a related habit of style which is common to African storytellers and storytellers all over the Southwest Indian Ocean, which poses an interesting problem for the translator. The storytellers in those parts of the world prefer to quote the dialogue of their characters rather than summarize it, as in the passage I just read. That's a quotation from, that, that's the baby speaking from his mother's womb. When I translate or when I report the speech of Southwest Indian Ocean folk tales, I naturally reproduce the dialogue, but I also feel bound to remind my reader by a literalness which is doubtless tiresome on paper of the large number of times an artist reminds his audience that a character is speaking. One storyteller from the island of Réunion, Daniel Fontaine, incessantly says, la dit, or id, that means he says, he says. He incessantly says that, over and over. Sidney Joseph, whom I knew in the village of Grand Berrier in the island of Mauritius, invariably labels his character's dialogue. Well, whoever first wrote down the Ibunya epic shows the narrator saying, unu, they say, so they're saying it over and over. And I translate this device for the same reason that a storyteller uses it to remind the silent, solitary reader 
of the distance between writing and hearing. Translators in the past often omitted it, assuming their reader, uh, assuming that the, their, glo their global context required them to move an oral text as close as possible to the reader of novels. But some readers today, at least, are ready to be moved closer to the oral styles developed by Africans over the centuries. There are now CDs that allow you to hear the pitch patterns and pacing of African and Malgash masters of words, even if we don't understand their words, and compare these to what we know, for example, in African-American culture. You can just do that with your ear. But you will say, what about other obstacles? The fundamental obstacles in translating Africa in global contexts are, of course, political. Often they are not expressed. A tiny example is the fact that the press run of the translation of Ibunya was so small that the book went out of print in almost immediately after publication. That's why I don't have a Confederate selling copies in the back of the room. Uh, <laughs> the market for a translated epic from Madagascar was going to be pretty small. Literature and language are always subject to decisions and forces of that kind. That's the politics of literature. The manual I wrote for UNESCO is another example. Today, three years after the manuscript was submitted, the intangible cultural, her cultural heritage section of UNESCO shows no sign of publishing it. There, the political obstacle is the question of representation, of who represents whom. Representation is a foundational concept in aesthetics, semiotics, political theory. In folklore, how verbal art shall be represented poses serious problems of form, and these problems have a political dimension. There are several steps, aren't there, between the performance of an East African folktale and its availability to you in a book in your hand. Someone has to listen. Someone has to write it down in the local language. Someone has to translate it literally into another language. Someone has to decide how it should look on a page if he, could, he or she can persuade anyone to publish it. And anthropologists and folklorists brood continually over our interviewing, our recording, our transcription and translation methods. See, matter con continually being reevaluated. How shall I represent in writing the range of intonational and vocal possibilities that lie between the extremes of ordinary talk and song? Performers in East Africa and Mauritius often alternate between speaking and singing. To put the alternation into print, the folklorist like me has to produce a, uh, something like a hybridization of verse and prose, which is what I did for Ivonia. <clears throat> One successful answer comes from the folklorist Peter Seitel, whose fascinating translations of narratives of the Haya of Tanzania were a model for my work on Ibonya. To make these intonational and vocal possibilities visible to an English reader, Peter Seitel adapts some devices of representation which were pioneered by Dennis Tedlock for narratives of the Zuni of New Mexico. Pauses in the performance are notated according to length by a new line, indentation, or one or two small circles in the left margin. Intonation is indicated by punctuation. A louder voice is indicated by capital letters, a deep voice by small capitals, and special intonation by italics. These typographic devices denote both intonation and pace. Thus, they represent on a page the manipulations of the channel available to a Haya narrator. Peter Seitel, along with Dennis Tedlock and Del Himes, takes the position which African performance certainly bears out that all oral narrative is inherently poetic in the sense of being organized in lines. When it called for the creation of a manual on preserving oral traditions and expressions, the intangible cultural heritage section of UNESCO stressed, and I quote, the importance of community involvement in the process of inventorying, including the respect and use of local categorizations for oral traditions and expressions. 
and the right of communities to decide whether a certain element of their intangible cultural heritage should be included into an inventory or not, and thereby respecting taboos and secret elements that may exist. How shall a community decide what use to make of the oral literature and knowledge it has marked as traditional? How can the foreign expert help? The question, what is a community for African folklore, goes hand in, hand in hand with the question, what is literary or artistic or intellectual property? Who owns Ibunya or any of the other African epics that are now being transcribed and translated? All African folklore, including epics, exists in variant forms. Who owns those? Is Ibunya owned by the nation of Madagascar? Some people can't conceive of history or literature except within a nationalist frame. African oral literature had no use for such a frame, yet our studies are beset by nationalism and within nations by ethnocentrism. Is Ibunya owned by the French scholar who has recently recorded and published variant forms of it? Is it owned by the publisher of my translation? Or is it owned in its multiple variant forms by Marin Men of Words? The, 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 the uh, Marin word for it is Mpikabar, which literally means a man of words. Or by the undetermined number of Marin speakers who have heard it performed. Shall the Marin be called a community and be credited with rights of ownership? If so, what powers of ownership can they exercise? Conceptually, this question will remain an obstacle to free exchange of African cultural products. I believe it's insoluble. Another obstacle is this notion of community. What is a community anyway? In its 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage, UNESCO awards an important role to communities, evidently as a conceptual advance over envisioning temples and archaeological sites as the only monuments of world culture, and also an advance over uh, the, the awarding of rights of ownership of culture to nations. Yet, as soon as we look at closely at any folk group, a village of neighbors or a set of people speaking the same language like Marin or adherence to any religion, as soon as we look closely at any group, we find internal division. How shall a community decide whether some element of their intangible cultural heritage or folklore should or should not be included in an inventory? Members of, of a community are not all alike nor do they have common goals. Their differences are real and affect their valuation of oral traditions and expressions. Because oral traditions and expressions are performed in particular situations, individual performers have a major stake in them. But then, so have audiences, in particular uh, the, the, the groups that audiences belong to and the communities where audiences belong, not to mention scholars like me. As with the notion of property, the notion of community is a conceptual obstacle to translating Africa for the world. After all these considerations, I'm going to put forward today several propositions about translating African cultural products. One such proposition I have stated already, that translation is an ethical and political act. A second proposition is that folklore and translation are inseparable and had better begin accommodating each other as disciplines. In these decades, while I've been researching the islands, the two fields of folklore studies and translation studies have been growing and maturing in parallel. At the last annual meeting of the Modern Language Association of America in December 2009, translation studies took up the majority of the program. Not enough was said there about oral literature or folklore. Uh, literary theorists and translators don't know much about African verbal art. Yet in West Africa, the folklorist Kwesi Yanka has shown the royal spokesman, who is both the mouth and the ear of the chief, to be an emblem of the translator. The theoretical implications of African folklore performance have yet to be acknowledged by translators. My third proposition is that translation is happening all around us, that cultural mixing and renegotiation 
are ubiquitous and universal. It happens in all global contexts. In literature, for instance, the most pressing challenge for critics is the mix of languages being used for literatures around the world. West Indian and African writing in English and French, Yiddish literature, Chicano literature, uh, Afro-American literature, the, the list grows every day. The mix of languages for literature shows most clearly to English readers in the Caribbean literature of the last 30 years. Meanwhile, anthropologists discovered that since all human groups maintain a mixed culture, even when they think of themselves as maintaining purity and antiquity, the object of study for anthropologists and folklorists had to be the dynamics of mixing. This was the major ethnographic discovery of the 20th century. It was initiated by linguists who discovered that when people of diverse linguistic and cultural backgrounds uh, come into contact, they invent special ways of speaking. As they maintain these ways of speaking, in continuing contrast to standard forms of speaking, they form into pidgin and creole languages. The artistic manipulation of pidgins and creoles leads to inventing new ideas, new tales, songs, new proverbs. Analogously, in cultures dominated by writing and electronic communication, like ours, parodies, jokes, and secular rituals are continually invented, and their genres continually invite new performances. Where groups bearing contrastive linguistic and cultural traditions are forced into sustained contact, they quickly come to know something of the other groups, and many members are as proficient in the cultural activities of other groups as of their own. Cultural creolization took place in Africa long before colonization or the inception of the world economic system. Now we see it everywhere, in world music, kosher pizza, Irish pubs in Estonia or Ghana. You can think of your own examples. Cultural creolization epitomizes the world's artistic production. Orality and literacy can no longer be conceived as stable or unchanging. Rather, they interpenetrate continually. So African leadership has given a major reorientation to, for example, medieval studies in Europe. My fourth proposition is that by amassing enormous amounts of proverbs, riddles, folktales, sculptures, and vernacular architecture, Africa makes a decisive contribution to a current concern in several fields of knowledge. The concern is the redefinition of metaphor and metonymy. Now, these are concepts that a college freshman has to learn, which, however, her professors are continuing to debate about. The concept of metonymy, in particular, looms large in cognitive science. Cognitive linguistics points out that people have an encyclopedic knowledge of a particular domain, but also the cultural models they are part of. For this encyclopedic knowledge, neg cognitive linguistics invents a term, idealized cognitive model. That's an, a new translation of the idea of metonymy. The traditional definition of metonymy in handbooks of literature called it the application of one term to something else it is closely associated with. Metaphor and metonymy, says the cognitive linguist, are closely related to each other in conceptual space. So that whereas metaphor arises between concepts, metonymy can be produced by a more varied set of things, concepts, forms, and reference belonging to different realms, but to the same idealized cognitive model. African folklore offers data with which to test this redefinition. Africa's most popular story, for instance, is the story about the defiant girl, which operates essentially metonymically. In this story, which is known all over Africa and the Southwest Indian Ocean Islands, a young woman refuses eligible suitors in favor of an unknown husband who turns out to be a monster. She is extricated from her impossible marriage by a member of her family of birth. Um, and I could talk a lot about that story, but because uh, it's been very much studied and interpreted. All the elements in the story, the defiant daughter, her birth family, her monster husband, uh, Vera local ma marriage uh, in the locality of her husband, and her rescue, all of the elements in the story are contiguous in memory and tradition. So 
And the, and the cognitive linguist says many conceptual metaphors derive from conceptual metonymies. So one way of understanding African folk tales like that one is to say they are metonymic instruments which their culture has provided them to conceive what the world is about. Here's an opportunity for bringing together ethnographic research in Africa and cognitive linguistics in the West. The thousands of proverb texts recorded in African languages, if they were searched, would reveal some of the ways that metonymy interacts with other tropes. Already the work of Harold Scheub in South Africa demonstrates that all African oral genres are animated by metaphor. Prose and verse are generated through the specific application by verbal artists of conceptual metaphors and cognitive models shared by the whole community. The implications are large, so are the research questions. For example, to what extent and in what ways do the idealized cognitive models or metonyms of one African language group resemble or differ from those of another group? What is the force of the cognitive model or metonymy in the socialization of children? The practices of African verbal artists offer an answer, at least a hypothetical one, to the whole question of creativity in the arts of the word. I conclude with what the late great anthropological linguist Del Himes said, which remains true of Africa. An oral literature is not able to defend itself. The world's literatures are not on equal footing. The original text is normative, yet one wants it to speak to places and people not its own. One wants to establish a connection between different languages and settings without reducing either to the other. Translation of Africa in global contexts, therefore, is what Henri Michonique says a poem is, the transformation of a form of language by a form of life, and the transformation of a form of life by a form of language. Recently, the International Comparative Literature Association has initiated an inquiry into why oral literature so seldom shows up in the histories of literature. I expect the answer to be because critics don't want their form of life transformed. Oral performers do the thing that comparative literature critics find to praise in literary authors. Oral, literature, oral performers do make use of the whole of the heretical transnational heritage that has been accumulated. What if someone pointed out to those wide-ranging perceptive critics the number of African societies who celebrate through performance every day their ownership and artistic use of a local language? Can they hear? This is where translation and the translator come in. Three things have to be translated. The system of an African vernacular poetics, the rhetoric of African narrative, and the politics symbolized in African expressive culture. Studying such performances could well be the task not merely of literary critics, but also videographers in the coming years. The most vivid way to experience an African literary system is via television anyway. Thank you. We could have some questions or discussion. Peggy. Well, I just say, you know, there's there's a lot that you've put out here, so you, you could go in a lot of different directions. <laughs> but I, I wanted to, to go back to your, you know, your discussion of intellectual property. It's mm. interesting to me that, um, you know, all of the problems that you've raised are, are definitely um, out there. The fact that people are trying to um, lay claim ownership of certain things that right. obviously don't, you know, don't stay in one place right. and they don't stay the same. Right. And it's interesting to me, though, that in the World Intellectual Property Organization context, the demanders are the African group. Mm -hmm. The African group is absolutely adamant that there should be uh, copyright protection, uh, mm -hmm. uh, patent protection for, in, for what in white is called traditional cultural expression. Yes. And um, I encountered this. I encountered this in Kenya when I was there in July. It, I, I understand very well what, what you're talking about. Kenya itself has its own national organization for copyright protection. 
and then I'm sure the same story is, can be told in a number of other countries. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, but uh, so the nation states, and this is the problem with UNESCO too, the members are nation states who are not cultural entities, they're not communities, they are political entities. Right. And so they, when they get into the business of culture, they're really... Um, at sea. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They're at sea, yeah, yeah. Um, the um, officers in ministries of culture are the people who are clamoring for copyright protection and patent protection and so forth. Isn't that because they were so well educated by Europeans? Uh, they, uh, and every African political leader is ready to talk about the evil heritage of colonialism, but there is one. That is one right there. That is, if you believe that uh, that um, culture can really be regulated by the kind of property law that John Locke invented in the late 17th century, uh, for which which uh, led to the to the uh, bringing to an end the the common grazing lands, for example, in the UK. If you you know if, if you don't have any problem with that transfer, then you can then you can make the transposition of property law onto cultural matters. But I, I, I said and I believe that it's insoluble, and I say that because I'm standing outside uh, the the issue. I'm not trying to find a solution for it because I believe that it's that it's conceptually impossible to do that. But um, I I know that many well-meaning people whom I respect are struggling with this with this issue all the time. And if, if somebody in a group like this says, well, what's your answer? I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, it's it has to do with the history of their being populated, the way they get populated. Um, Mauritius is the island I know the best. Um, this is always hard for people in the West to understand. Mauritius was unpopulated until the 16th century. There was not anybody there. Um, the Dutch attempted to colonize it. <laughs> they brought in slaves from Africa slaves burned down the settlement and the Dutch left. Uh, subsequently, the island was taken over by France and uh, who had a bit more success in um, not only in uh, planting and exporting crops but also in importing slaves. So that uh, at present, um, the about one quarter of the population of Mauritius are of African or Madagascar descent. Um, the majority population in Mauritius are the descendants of Indian indentured laborers who were t brought in by the British when, after the British took over the island from the French. Um, and there are a couple of other strands of population. So the uh, cultural, the student of culture has, in the case of Mauritius and in all those other islands, an enormous advantage, which is we know lots and lots about the history of how those islands got populated. and. It is. Uh, it remains true that the descendants of slaves in Réunion and in Mauritius and and the Comores uh, are always at the bottom of the society. They are the the always disregarded, and um, they the other strands of culture, which uh, coexist with the African strand, uh, get more press. So I don't know if that answers the question, but the, it is very much true that the Indo-Mauritians who dominate the life of the island of Mauritius would have you believe that African-derived culture uh, is, is, not, is not real in their culture. And that was, that, so immediately I picked up on that. That was, that was the first thing I thought of, well, we, I must conduct a project that demonstrates that traditional 
African-derived storytelling is alive and well in their island, and it is. And so I succeeded to do that, I'm glad to say. Sir. Professor Heron, thank you for your talk, and I do appreciate the journey that you took us from uh, thinking of African translation as transparent to mm. the infusion of self to someone willing to take on another self. Right. Uh, I think that um, as you were finishing up, you started to talk about uh, a little bit about architecture and mm. Mm. as the African literature, as mm -hmm. the catalyst to the griot expressing the story to the community. Um, and of course, the Dogon doors and their cosmological significance uh, often aren't seen as literature, and I just wanted to get your opinions on that. There's always somebody in a group like this that knows more about this stuff than I do. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, the <laughs> I don't believe that one kind of art um, pushes out another. I certainly don't believe for a minute that African uh, material culture has squashed or suppressed African verbal art. However, it remains true that it's always been easier to go to an African country and sweep up some objects in material culture and take them away to a museum than it is to take the patience to get to know verbal artists to enlist their trust to spend enough time to transcribe and translate their very complex materials. And I think that's a big reason why African verbal art is not as well represented in Western culture as, as African sculpture is. Uh, and that, con that continues to be true. However, the, the, f the metaphorical process, the the, uh, the metonymic process is at work in material culture as it is in verbal art. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask, you were talking about blind place, and then you said metaphors and the metonymy. Mm. Could you give me some examples of metonymy? Well, um, if I say, um, if, if you start talking to me about um, poetry, and you tell me um, that you're uh, very fond of the poetry of Langston Hughes. And if I tell you, oh, I've read all of Langston Hughes, then my use of the name of the poet to stand for the poetry that he produced is metonymy. See? Um, the textbook example in the literary handbooks is, is just a short distance from here. They talk, the White House, every day the journalists talk about the White House has decided this, or the White House is saying that, or the White House is leaning in such a, that's met metonymy. The use of uh, a name to represent, to stand for something with which it is closely associated. Of course, it, journalistically, it has a lot of advantages, too, because if you say the White House thinks so-and-so, then you're not attributing it to any human being who, therefore, is absolved from taking any responsibility. It's, very, it's a very char charming device. You said something about study of African oral tradition influencing medieval studies, mm. I think. Can you explain a little about that? Well, you have to look at what I wrote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There is, a, there is a, no. I was, I was asked to contribute to a literary history book on the mixing of verse and prose, which and it was the editors were uh, medievalists, and I looked at this phenomenon, and I looked at the nature of orality, and it came to me that prose and verse are print concepts that don't much work for oral performance. So I wrote an article that said you're, you, you're turning, you have the whole thing on its head if you look at the actualities of the production of, of verbal art, especially oral verbal art, then uh, there, the, the prose and verse, uh, you can't use those terms. You're going to have to find other terms. And Himes, in his work on Native American texts, um, started talking about about channels. I mean, there is there is ordinary speaking, and then there is chanting, and then there is singing. There are all these different 
kinds of channel that, p that can be used for oral performance. And um, all that I am suggesting is that if you look at the literature of the Middle Ages as oral stuff that's being written down, and heaven knows, they all, they all admit that, all medievalists admit that the, the great bulk of written literature has some relation, either close or distant, to orality, then uh, the concept of the mixing of prose and verse is not a useful concept. That's what I meant. I don't know if any of those medievalists got convinced by this argument, but, <laughs> but, but they asked me to contribute, so I said what I had to say. Yes? I'm sorry to come back and ask another question, but I think it is wide open. We, it is wide open. We have, have no rules. Oh, um, pigeon um, is provisional, and a Creole it ends up being somebody's native language. So that people in all all Mauritians speak Mauritian Creole, um, and then they learn other languages. But that is the that is the the native language in Seychelles. Seychelles has the distinction I, uh, of being one of the only nations in the world that succeeded in elevating its Creole language to the status of a national language. So everybody in Seychelles is bilingual in Seychellois Creole and English. Um, and it's, it, but the, the, the simplest difference is that a Creole can be and is somebody's native language. I think Haiti also has adopted. Oh, really? Uh -huh. See, those of us who work on one side of the world don't know what goes on on the other side of the world. It <laughs> just, just happens that way. Um, I'm wondering how you would place Kiswahili then in that mix, a language that um, is, is a mixture of Bantu languages and, and Arabic coming together. I would place Kiswahili the same place I speak, I place English. It is a language that historically was a result of the mixture of, of the convergence of cultures, of, uh, by the way, of dominance and oppression as well. And uh, there is, for some reason, Swahili has been um, described very often as some kind of illegitimate hybrid. Well, if Swahili is an illegitimate hybrid, then so is French, which after all is Latin spoken by Germans. Uh, and uh, so, um, and I think that, that the reason um, that's, that Kiswahili has had that bad press is, in, is some kind of political, you know, there's some political thing behind that, which I've never understood, but it certainly doesn't smell right to me. I, uh, well. Sir? Yeah, I, I just want to ask a different question. I would like you to pretend that you are that you are an African for a moment. <laughs> an African who comes to the United States for the first time, and you happen to come from uh, an African family, and then you come here to to live with Americans. You observe them, you see, and what would you pick up on on American? You have to go back to your African village. How, how would you go about explaining to your people who have never been to America? Explain, explain to them how Americans are like in their countries. How, the first thing, I, yeah, I, 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 I understand the the and there are many answers, but the first thing I would say to my African family is, you have no idea what little loyalty or connection these Americans show to their family members. You cannot hope to understand how disconnected fathers and sons are, mothers and daughters, grandparents and grandchildren. They, they are all over the map. They had this huge country and it is expected by parents that the next generation will move hundreds or thousands of miles away and they don't, that doesn't bother them at all. That's the first thing I would say about the, the fragmentary, the, 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 because from the African side, that's inconce this is inconceivable. Second thing I would say is, 
you have no idea how many different kinds of food these people eat, and, th and they can never make up their mind what they're going to eat next. They don't have any proper regular diet like, like maize and beans. They, they, they eat different things all the time, as though they, they don't know what proper food is. Um, how would you answer your own question? I bet. <laughs> well, those are the, those were two that occurred to me right away. Family and food. I don't know the. Uh, um, well, I guess developing the first idea. The African is saying. For some reason, these people don't like to spend much time with each other. They don't seem to like each other very much. I'm talking about white people, of course. Uh, <laughs> not, not talking about African Americans, who, who thankfully have preserved a lot of, of the African-derived sense of, of community and, and harmony. But white people don't like, they don't like each other. They don't seem to like each other very much. I don't know. That's, that's me as the African. Thank you for letting me play that role. <laughs> Maybe one more question, then people can talk to you uh, informally afterwards. Yes, fine. No? Good. Thank you all very much. Oh, no, no, there is somebody after all. Not, I know my background is anthropology, and uh, not a question. Reinforcement of the point you just made. It's the 1890s. Census has been taken in this country every 10 years. Americans have been increasing the size of their homes and decreasing the number of people who live in them. Right, so right, regardless of right. Regardless of ideology, we come from family values, rugged individualism. Bottom line is, when we've got the money, right. we want to live in more space with fewer people. Right. And that tradition <laughs> has gone on through time. Thank you Not so much for debate. <laughs> part of our national character. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I would add, by the way, that we also reserve the right to not spend much time in that house. Uh, we we have because we have a couple of other houses elsewhere. Okay, we're going to stop now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.